I thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the important issue of high cost reform. I'm the research director for Free Press, a public interest organization dedicated to public education and consumer advocacy on communications policy. Technology is rapidly changing the way Americans interact, learn, and do business, and all for the better. But the rules governing our communications markets are not keeping up with this rapid pace of change, and consumers are suffering as a result. When the current universal service regime was created in 1996, the internet was an application that rode on top of the telephone infrastructure. Today, it's the opposite. Telephony is just one of many applications that ride on top of broadband infrastructure. With this convergence comes the opportunity to ensure universal affordable access, broadband access while also reducing the future burden on the fund. We strongly support the goals of universal service. Everyone benefits when rural consumers have access to affordable, high-quality communication services. But as advocates for the consumers whose monthly bills support the fund, we want to ensure that our system of universal service is both fair and efficient. Consumers in the 21st century marketplace should not be forced to subsidize a 20th century technology. We believe a bold and transformative shift in USF policy is needed. Done properly, we can bring affordable broadband to all Americans while also substantially reducing the size of the fund in the long term. Here's how. We must begin by asking two basic questions. How much money is each USF supported line receiving each month? And is that support actually needed? Our research shows that 40% of the high cost fund nearly $2 billion annually goes to subsidizing lines that receive less than $10 per month. This is also true for small rate of return carriers. Two-thirds of these lines receive less than $10 per month in high cost support. Now, these subsidies may be justified, but it begs the question, is this the best use of that $2 billion? We also should ask whether rates in these areas are already below the national average. And should we instead be using this money for broadband deployment to bring rural customers more than just a telephone line? The path to universal broadband and the ending of the over-reliance on subsidies begins with recognizing how convergence has changed the business of telecommunications. Before broadband, carriers were only able to earn perhaps $20 per customer each month selling local phone service. In today's converged world, a carrier can earn well over $100 on that same line by offering phone, TV, and internet services. Unfortunately, our current regulatory structure does not account for this potential, ignoring that with this additional revenue, many high-cost carriers can operate profitably without ongoing subsidies. Instead, it tries to clumsily separate out regulated from unregulated costs and revenues and really results in overpayments and anti-competitive subsidies. As an alternative to this broken process, we suggest basing ongoing high-cost support on total revenue earning potential and forward-looking infrastructure costs calculated for each carrier on a granular, disaggregated basis. This modernized regulatory structure will reduce the need for ongoing support as many carriers will be able to recoup network costs and earn healthy profits from triple play services. However, for some carriers, the upfront cost for deploying broadband into currently unserved areas is just too high. Here is where we have the opportunity to turn the regulatory structure on its head. We should use the fund to pay these upfront costs and then only provide ongoing support where it is truly needed. We propose a 10-year transition where the new total cost potential revenue support model is phased in and the resulting cost savings are used to fund the build out of open access broadband infrastructure into unserved areas. We estimate that after this transition, the total size of the high cost fund could be reduced by two thirds to less than 1.5 billion per year. Now, the 7 billion in broadband stimulus funds presents policymakers with a window of opportunity to transform USF. Here, a substantial portion of the upfront cost for rural networks may be financed by taxpayer dollars. The carriers operating these networks will thus have little capital cost to recover and therefore little need for ongoing support. But unless the FCC moves to modernize the regulatory structure, we may see double dipping. Now by that I mean carriers might ask ratepayers to reimburse them for the networks already paid for by taxpayers. Now getting universal service policy right isn't the only thing we need to do to ensure universal service. For rural carriers, the viability of the self-supporting triple play business model depends on getting fair rates and terms for transport and special access services and getting fair access to video programming. In closing, we urge Congress to maintain its commitment to universal service, but to do so with policies that are flexible and that benefit all consumers. I thank you for your attention and I look forward to your questions.